uh, as we look at this, um, I don't call it the chiastic structure. I know that's written in there because generally people say, what's a chiastic structure? I just call it the prophet's code. And let me explain it this way. Imagine taking a rock and you throw it in a pond. What do you have? Well, you have a ripple, you have a splash, and then that ripple effect across the pond. And the ripples on one side look like the ripples on the other side. And the book of Revelation is written exactly like that. Chapter 12 is the very center of the book, and it ripples out from the center. So what's on one side, words and phrases, are the same words and phrases on the other side. And we're going to look at these charts. And, and if this goes too fast, you can visit our website. We're publishing the entire prophet's codes on there. And we've written a commentary in Daniel Revelation that's inside that, too. So, but here's one of the things. When it comes to understanding the book of Revelation, there's two things that are basically very difficult for people. It's the structure and the symbols. Now, the easiest thing to teach is the structure. In fact, you can understand all of what Revelation basically is about without understanding one symbol. If you only knew the structure. So people are wondering, well, you got seven of this and seven of that. How do you make sense out of the structure? And then people have problems with the symbols, too. But imagine if you understood both. You understood the structure, and then with principles of interpretation, you also understood the symbols. Well, then you can understand Revelation for yourself. And I've, I've been with a number of Adventist churches, and people have gone through three, four, five Revelation seminars and still don't feel like they understand it themselves. Why? Because the structure is confusing and some of the symbols are still confusing. And it's kind of like, how do you make heads and tails out of this? So what we want to do is we want to go through the structure. And again, the prophet's code is like throwing that rock in a pond and there's a splash. That's chapter 12, the center of the book. And everything ripples out from the center. For example, on either side of chapter 12 is chapter 11 and chapter 13. And what you'll see in a chapter or in one of the frames coming up, you have chapter 11, two witnesses, and on the exact opposite side of the center, two beasts. Isn't that interesting? And you'll see in this chart that they have the same description. You'll have seven trumpets, chapters 8 and 9, and then seven last plagues on the exact opposite side of the center. Same key word in the exact same order. Now, what we're also going to see is that each ripple from the center is going to answer a different question. Okay, So let's go ahead and let's look at the overall structure of the prophet's code. The center is chapter 12. Everything ripples out from there. So the words and phrases on chapters 1 through 11 are going to be repeated in chapters 13 through 22. The words and phrases will be repeated, and you'll see that. But as it ripples out, you'll see that we're answering different questions. The original question, chapter 12, is what is the origin of evil? Chapter 12 is really all about that. And we live in an evil world, would you agree? And evil's gotten inside of us. Now, when you're trying to help someone who's sick, isn't it always good to know what you're dealing with first? So we really want to know what is the origin of evil so we can deal with it, right? Then... What we're going to find, and I haven't proven it yet, but you'll see it in the charts, the words and phrases in chapters 8 through 11 are going to be the same words and phrases in 13 through 16, and we'll see that. And what I'm going to submit to you is that it's answering a different question. And the question that's being answered here is how does God fight against evil forces? The original question, chapter 12, what is the origin of evil? But the next ripple effect is how does God fight against evil? Now, do you notice that these questions are asked slightly different? Chapters 8 through 11, how has, past tense, God have fought against evil through the centuries? You see, the chapters that precede chapter 12 are answering these questions from a historical perspective, from the early church through the centuries up to the second coming. Chapters 13 on are simply answering them from an end time perspective. How will God fight against evil in the end of time? And these are, this is the important question to us, because we live in an evil world, don't we? Now, chapters 13 through 16 aren't going to tell us what all the evil forces in our world are, is, but it identifies two of them. First beast, second beast. Who are they? Papacy and apostate Protestants, isn't it? These are the two evil forces in our world that influence people's salvation more than anything. That doesn't mean they're the only evil forces in the world. 
that God identifies them, but he also gives us a message, the three angels' message in chapter 14. Remember, we fight against evil with what? With good, with truth. And uh, we always want to keep that in mind. We're not eye for an eye kind of thing. This is, this is God's shining character through us fighting evil as he fights evil. He tries to win people, doesn't he? Weren't we once promoting evil and living in evil? What did he do for us? He won us. That's exactly how we have to fight the evil in our own day. But it's important that we understand how God fought evil in the past. Why? Because God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. However, he, however, how he fought evil in chapters 8 through 11 through the centuries is the same way he's going to fight against evil in the end of time. So we'll learn a lot about what God wants to do in the end of time by simply looking at what he did in the past. Okay? Well, we ripple out a little further, and we're going to see in our charts coming up, the words and phrases in chapters 4 through 7 have the same or sim words and phrases in chapters 17 through 19. And this is going to answer a different kind of question. How does God judge evil? And again, chapters 4 through 7 are answering it from a historical perspective. How will God, or how has God judged evil through the centuries? Why is that important to know? He hasn't changed. And if he said this is a saved condition in the past, well, that's a saved condition today. And if he says that's a lost condition in the past, well, then I know that's still a lost condition. Now, you may be ask, answering, and this is a fair question, you say, okay, Jeff, how do you know these are the right questions? Well, the way that we arrived at these questions is simply by looking, what is the emphasis in these chapters? So let's just take chapters 17 through 19 as an example. So, so let's turn to Revelation 17. Revelation chapter 17. And, and, and let me just say this. If you have any questions as we're going through this, um, go ahead and ask. I don't want to go too fast because we want to understand the structure. In fact, if you have a thumb drive or I can leave it with someone, if you want this presentation, you can have it. Because the important thing is that we have many people teaching people the structure of Daniel Revelation, you know. Um, in fact, I just had a friend that just got a website for me called prophecyteacher.com, which would be neat. We're trying to teach people to be teachers. And, and that would be a neat, so as to put up a lot of different information, uh, we come together and do that. It would be a neat thing to promote. Um, so let's look at Revelation chapter 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the what? The judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. So we really know what chapter 17 is really all about. It's about judgment, isn't it? And we can look at it. Even when it, you, there are going to be some verses that don't use the word judgment, but we know we're talking about judgment. For example, look at verse 16, same chapter. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, um, these shall hate the whore, shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Now, the word judgment's not there, but is that a judgment scene? Yeah, she's being judged, isn't she? Um, let's look at verse eight, chapter 18, verse 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. The word judgment's not there, but is that a judgment call? God says you're what? You're fallen, you're fallen. Okay? So if my mom says, Jeff, you're naughty, you're naughty, that means I was really naughty, right? So here is Babylon has fallen, is fallen, right? Okay. If we turn to verse 8 of the same chapter, chapter 18. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who does what? You see chapters 8, 17, 18, 19, this is really all about judgment. Let's keep going. Verse 10. Standing afar off for the fear of our torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy what? Your judgment has come. Isn't that interesting? There is more in chapter 18, but let's go to 19, verse 2. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged, that's another kind of judgment word, the blood of her servants at her hands. Verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was faith, called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth does what? Judge and make wars. And so as you can see, as we go through, I didn't make up these questions. The questions come from the text. What is the emphasis of these chapters? 
That's how we arrived at these questions. We know 17 through 19, we're talking about judgment. Does that mean the same words and phrases that are in 4 through 7 is also about judgment, but just from a different time perspective? It's through the centuries in 4 through 7, whereas in the end of time, we realize how will God judge evil in the end. And that's important for us because we want to be on the right side. Okay. Now, this would really be kind of an incomplete path picture. If all we talked about, if ever, ever Revelation just ended here and it says, what's the origin of evil? How does God fight against evil? How does he judge evil? It's really an incomplete picture until you get to this question. How does God deliver from evil? Isn't that right? And chapters 1 through 3 is how God had delivered, no matter your spiritual condition, those seven churches, there was always a solution. You see, they all had a little different makeup, a little different situation, but there was a remedy. And this was God through the centuries helping his people overcome evil in the past. Well, if God could help people overcome sin in before, he can help people today, couldn't he? Okay. And this is when you get to chapters 20 through 22, this is how God's going to deliver from evil forever. Where there is no more evil. It's a new heaven and a new earth. Isn't that interesting? And you're going to see a lot of words and phrases in chapters 1 through 3 being repeated in 20 through 22. And the vast majority of those words and phrases that are repeated are focused on one person, Jesus. Because Jesus is the answer to the question, how do you overcome evil? And you really get back to Christ. He is the key. Okay? Any questions at this point? Okay? So let's go ahead and let's look at chapter 12 itself. This is chapter 12. It also has the same structure as the entire book. Now look at this. So I'll just go through this quick and go back. Uh, victory of Christ, victory of people. This is the center of the chapter. Now notice what's on either side of the center here. Satan cast to the earth, Satan cast the earth. War in heaven, war on earth. Three attacks by Satan, three attacks by Satan. Early church described, God's last day church described. Isn't that interesting? It's an actual perfect order. So let's go back. And then let me actually ask you a question. Why is there a center to the center? Is that a fair question? The center is chapter 12, and there's a center to the center. There's a center in chapter 12 itself. And I believe the answer is because God wants us to help us understand what is the central issue in the great controversy. And all you have to do is go to the very center of the book to find out what the central issue is. Okay, so let's do that. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 12. <clears throat> and I do want to look at a few verses in that chapter first, Revelation chapter 12. And, and I don't know if we'll have time this session, but do you know the book of Daniel is written the exact same way? With the exact same questions in the exact same order. Origin of evil, how does God fight evil, how does he judge evil, how does he deliver from evil? The exact same order. Now that tells us something about God, doesn't it? He's perfect. That this was not written by man. Okay? Now, what I also find very interesting, when I've shared this with evangelicals, you see, they don't have a structure like this. Because they teach futuristic views of prophecy. Where chapters 1 through 3 are historical, but chapters 4 through the rest of the book are all future. But you see, the structure proves that they're not right. Isn't that right? So... You know, you start looking, what are some of the key, what's something we can find that could help people take another look at prophecy? You know, they're so tied up in the Left Behind series books and stuff and being told what other people preach and it's all this future stuff and it's all focused on Israel and different things like that. What could we find as a tool to help people look at it differently and they say, you know, you've got something there. And I, this, I believe, is just perhaps a tool. But let's look at Revelation chapter 12. And I want us to look at verse 7. Now, we're talking about the origin of evil. And we know that evil started where? Actually, in heaven. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Now, who is Michael? It's Jesus. Now, I don't know how many different names there are for Jesus in the Bible, but there's quite a few. Lion from the tribe of Judah and so forth. But every word's inspired, isn't it? Now, somehow, John was inspired to use the word Michael here, the name Michael, as opposed to some other name. There must have been a purpose there, right? Okay. So, what does Michael mean? Who is like God, right? Very good. So, the war is over. 
who is like God? Or is Jesus just like the Father? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> and, when, and when you read Patriarchs and Prophets chapter 1, you'll realize that this whole battle, this whole controversy started over Lucifer questioning the authority of Jesus Christ. In fact, and let me just read a statement here. This is in Patriarchs and Prophets. Thanks for printing this off. It says, I think on page 40 here, it says, um, um, he declared that all who would, who would submit to the authority of heaven would be stripped of their honor, degraded by their position for himself. He was determined never again to acknowledge the authority of Christ. You see, this really is, in a way, it is, it is against the authority of the Father because he's against the authority of Christ. But Lucifer, you remember the statement where Christ is able to be in the councils with the Father? And Lucifer's questioning, why, why is Jesus able to be there and not myself? Because he's questioning whether Jesus is just like the Father. In other words, is Jesus equal to the Father? And if Jesus is not equal to the Father, then why does Jesus sit in these councils and not myself? You see? And that was the little thing he starts spreading around. And you realize that this whole controversy is over the authority of the Son of God. And do you realize that that controversy is the same controversy that goes on in every human heart? What do we do with Jesus? Do we recognize his authority or not? Isn't that what it's all about? You know, the, the, the issue between taking the seal of God or the mark of the beast is all an authority issue. Whose authority are we going to recognize? That's all it is. We're going to be under somebody's authority. And in some ways, we want to be under our own authority when we just choose to do what we want to do. Right? But we want to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. But Lucifer got to a point and says, I would never, never, never again says, submit to the authority of Jesus. And that's what he wants to do with each one of us. Somehow have enough rebellion in our heart that we choose to be our own God. Isn't that how he started it in the garden? You'll be like God deciding for yourself what's right and wrong. Okay? So what we want to do is we want to always be searchers of truth of God's word, having God tell us what's right and what's wrong, and we submit to it. That's the only safe way to go. Would you agree? Now, <clears throat> so let's. I want to turn to another verse here. This is in First uh, Corinthians. First Corinthians. First Corinthians ten, I believe. First Corinthians eleven. I'm sorry. First Corinthians eleven. The authority of Christ. Verse 3, but I would have you know, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, let me ask you a question. Is Jesus equal to the Father? Yes. Does the Father have more authority, though? Actually, he does. Jesus says the Father has more authority than me. You'll actually find some statements by Spirit of Prophecy that, G, that the Father has more authority than the Son. And this is where I'm thinking Lucifer got messed up in his mind. If the Father has more authority, therefore the Son must not be equal to. Does that make some sense? Okay. But what if the Father has more authority, but the Son is equally divine as the Father? See, that's what we believe. Yeah. So, I want us to look at this verse here. We looked at verse 3. Uh, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Okay, there's a verse for that. And then I got to verse 10. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the... And I got to that because of the angels. Why because of the angels? Why is the husband the head of the household because of the angels? Because the controversy started in heaven, right? So how does the... And you realize when you read Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 1, the Father actually came out to the whole angelic host to explain to them how his son was equal to himself. Isn't that something? Because of what Lucifer was lying about, saying that Jesus was not equal to the Father, the Father had to come out and explain to all the angels how his son was equal to himself in divinity. 
You read about that. Patriarchs and, Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 1. Up until that time, there was no controversy. No, there wasn't. There had been no question. Everybody worshipped the Son, worshipped the Father. But somehow, and this is, this is why it's a mystery, why we can't explain it. How did Lucifer, a perfect being in a perfect environment, become imperfect? And it, somehow it had to something to do with pride, but we can't, we can't pin it down because we're told if we could explain it, puts God at fault. So how do you take a perfect being in a perfect environment and make them perfect? But the same is true in the mystery of, of godliness. Yeah. How can you take an imperfect person in an imperfect environment and make them perfect in Christ? Right? <clears throat> That's a nice mystery. But it says here, because of the angels. And I looked at that verse and I says, well, okay, because this all started up there. So how does God help the angels understand how two people can be equal even if one had more authority? And you know what he did? He created Adam and Eve. Isn't that beautiful? And, and so he, creates, he didn't create Eve from his head as a superior or from his feet as an inferior, but he created Eve from his side to show that she's equal even though the husband is the head of the household. So the angels are watching our marriages to understand the beautiful relationship between the father and the son. Yeah. That's why against exactly, against family, the marriage itself. He wants to destroy that institution that began in Eden, which in part was started because to help the angels understand the true relationship between the father and the son. So husbands, you're to love your wife as much as a father loves his son. And when the father would make decisions, he brought his son into counsel, right? So, wives, you're to love your husbands as much as Jesus loves the father. You know, this is an endless study. So, it, it's a study where you say, how can I love my spouse more? Well, study your role there. Study the role of Jesus or study the role of the father. And we can just see. And you know, the greatest sermon is what? The, well, yeah, it's a, an ordered Christian home, isn't it? It is, yeah. The great people look at a well-ordered home that the kids are well behaved and mom and dad love each other and pray for one another, and it's like the gospel's working, right? The greatest sermon. I mean, the proof is there, right? So, so let's turn back to Revelation chapter twelve. Revelation chapter twelve. And we get to verse 10. This is in the center. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now, 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 now's a time sensitive word, isn't it? Because before that, it hadn't happened. But now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Now, word power is also the word authority. Uh, For the accused of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now, you'll notice up in verse 9, he's not cast down, but he's cast out. Verse 9, and the great red dragon or great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world, and he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So in verse 9, he's cast out of heaven, right? Here's this rebellion, God casts him out, but in verse 10, he's cast down. That's different, isn't it? Because he's cast down, why? In the people's minds, but he's cast down because... Christ just died. Yeah, Christ lived a perfect life, shown us the perfect father. And the devil couldn't get him to sin or disobey. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And so all these worlds in which Lucifer would go to and insinuate things, accusing the brethren, right? Once Christ died on the cross, he didn't have access to that anymore. You see, up until the cross, many of the unfallen worlds and even the loyal angels still had questions in their mind because Lucifer had couched all this stuff. He was so deceptive. And so, but once they saw Christ willing to die for those who were against him, right? I mean, even his disciples, they're gone. But he dies. And so they see the love of the Father. And they realized that Lucifer himself was in the crowd crying what? Crucify him, crucify him. Realized that from the beginning he was really a, a murderer, wasn't he? 
completely unmasked before the unfallen worlds. Now he's not just cast out of heaven, he's cast down. Now here's, here's to me the lingering question. If he, he's now cast down, why not just end all this? Why couldn't have Christ come soon right after the cross, being that Lucifer, everybody in heaven now knew, Everybody in heaven and all the unfallen worlds, they all now knew what Satan was up to. They didn't need to see anymore. But guess who still needs to see something? The human race. And God is saying, look, there needs to be another demonstration of the perfect character of my Father. Not just by done by the Son of God becoming the Son of Man. What has to happen before this all winds up? The 144,000, isn't it? Who perfectly reflect the image of Christ. You see, there has to be another demonstration of this before this whole thing wraps up. Okay? But notice that in verse 10, it talks about now has come the power of his Christ or the authority of Christ. So the central issue in the great controversy is over authority. And again, we realize this has to do with the commandments of God versus the commandments of men, right? This is all an authority issue. Now, how do you and I begin to recognize the authority of Christ in our life? Let's look at verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Where's the, where's the first, what's the first step in recognizing the authority of Christ in your life? Repentance, right? You give your sins to Christ, and he gives you a new heart in its place, doesn't he? He gives you the Holy Spirit. So the first time we recognize the authority of Christ is when we first come to Christ. But is that the end of recognizing his authority? Let's read on in that same verse, verse 11. And by the word of their testimony, what's that mean? That's the next step. We first come to Christ, and then we have a what? We have a testimony. And in a testimony is evidence, isn't it? That's right. Evidence that we're walking with Christ. Evidence that we gave our life to Christ is all part of recognize the authority of Christ in our life. And then the next verse is, and they love not their lives until the... What's that mean? They've been kept, they keep working on that testimony. They keep following them up until the rest, last days of their life, right? Last days. So, recognizing the authority of Christ means that we always recognize that authority up to the day we die. Even if that would be the reason we'd be put to death, right? Okay. Okay, any questions on chapter 12? Okay. I want us to look at another aspect, and this would be um, these last two ripples. We'll look at Satan's three attacks, nearly to describe in the next slide. So as we look at verses 3 through 6 and 14 through 17, this is a section about Satan's three attacks. What do you recognize here? How does Satan attack God or attack the truth or attack God's people? What do you see there? What's he use? He uses deception. The first thing we see is deception, and then we also see force. Now, I don't remember where it is in the book Maranatha, but she talks about how Satan uses this two-pronged attack, is deception and force. And really, right now, we're living in which time? Deception time, aren't we? Do you see that right now? Do you see that the devil's trying to deceive you away from settling into the truth? What are some of the things he's trying to use? TV, media, and marriage. Okay. You might want to, you might want to, what do you mean by marriage? Yep. Okay. Okay. Other thoughts? So we're living in deception time. And of course we see this in Daniel 3, don't we? That in the building of the golden image, it was a way of first deceiving people. And then if deception didn't work, they used force. Yes. Music, which is all part of Daniel 3 here. There, and if you look at Daniel 3, there's six instruments. And those six instruments are mentioned four times. Which means that the devil's trying to use music, man's music, right? The number six. Or Babylonian music. The number six is associated with Babylon. Babylonian music to deceive people to worship a golden image. Okay? And, of course, uh, using uh, leadership people, as we heard in our previous seminar, um, these were all the civil authorities. When all the civil authorities go one way, it just kind of sways the people that way, doesn't it? 
you see. So they used every way of trying to deceive people to worship the golden image, and when that didn't work, then they used force. And of course, we're seeing that many people are being deceived today from settling into the truth. Okay? All righty. All righty, so we see that. And then let's look at the slide on the early church described and the God's remnant church described, last day church. Being clothed with the sun is the same as keeping God's commandments, isn't it? Because being clothed with the sun is being clothed with the righteousness of Christ. What is the righteousness of Christ? Perfect obedience to those Ten Commandments. Isn't that interesting? And the moon under her feet? Well, under your feet means that's a platform on which you're standing, the foundation. The moon's a reflection of the sun. And the word is a reflection of God's character, isn't it? And so the early church was, as a foundation, was standing on the word of God. But on the exact opposite side of the chapter, God's last day church has the testimony of Jesus. Well, what's that? That's also the inspired word, too, of which we're just plan our foundation, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Isn't that interesting? What's on one side is exactly on the other side. It's all the way through this book this way. Crown of 12 stars. Um, the, there's two different words in Greek for crown. Now, you could have a like a royal crown or a victor's crown. You win the race. Two different words. And this is the victor's crown. You run the race because you're a star shining for Christ. And that's the only way we can really have victory. There's a statement by Sister White. I don't remember it was, but the only way we can overcome our own sins is by really investing in other people. You know, how, how do we really overcome our own sins if we don't take an interest in the salvation of another soul? Somehow we've got to invest in other people, be concerned about their salvation, do whatever we can to help people. And in doing that, we actually gain strength to overcome the sins in our own life. Okay? All righty. Any other questions about chapter 12 at this point? Okay, well, let's go on now to chapters 11 through 13. Uh, these are the chapters on either side of chapter 12. Uh, and you'll realize that in chapter 11 are the two witnesses, and in chapter 13, the exact opposite side of chapter 12, opposite side of the center are the two beasts. Now, as we go through this, I want you to notice that they have the same similar description. Now, notice also that when we're talking about chapters 1 through 11, we're talking about the historical side. So we want to spend a little bit of time talking about how do these two witnesses answer the question, how has God warred against evil forces in the past or through the centuries, right? And in chapter 13, that's on the end time side, the eschatological side, the side where the question's being asked, how will God fight against evil in the end of time, okay? But let's first just notice that they have similar words and phrases. So we get down to the next point. We find that God empowers the two witnesses. You'll see that in chapter 11, verses 3 and 6. But guess what the dragon does on the exact opposite side? Who's he empower? Isn't that interesting? God empowers the two witnesses, the Old and New Testament, but the dragon empowers the two beasts. God empowers his word, and in the end of time, the devil wants to empower the beast. Why does the devil want to do that? Because he really wants people not to look to the word, the power of the word, does he? And most people in the world are looking for a sign. Isn't that in Jesus' day? Show us a sign, we'll believe in you. And, and the devil's going to make sure that these two beasts are providing all kinds of signs and wonders, isn't it? So as to sway people to believe in the power of these two beasts over the power of the word. And this is where you and I need to become the people of the word again. Where we take the word to the people because there's power in that word and we get people to study the word and we base what we believe all in the word of God and we get that out to as many people as we can okay because they're going to be overwhelmed by two, one of two things God's word or these two beasts okay but when we look at it from the prophet's code and we realize that chapter 11 is on the side how has God warred against evil forces in the world Part of the answer, he's always used his word. How does God fight evil? With the word. Do you remember Paul when he tried to use persuasion and didn't use the word? He realized it didn't work. You ever tried to do that? Am I looking for hands? <laughs> Try to use your opinion or something like that. and It's not quite the same as a thus saith the Lord. 
And when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, he says, thus say the Lord, right? There's power in that word. Now, my car's parked out here. Start. Does anybody think my car's running? Oh, come on. <laughs> There's no power in my word. But if Christ said, start. Right? What a difference, huh? And so, and so there is power in the word. And this is why we need to get back in the word and share the word. Uh, let's look at some more of the, the comparisons here. The two witnesses prophesied for 1,260 prophetic days, right? And the first beast rules for 42 months. Same period of time. Isn't that interesting? Same description. God's word speaks with authority as fire symbolically proceeds out of the mouth of the Old New Testament. And then on Revelation 13, the opposite side, the second beast is able to make fire come down out of heaven. What you find on one side, you find on the other side. It says here, those who oppose God's word will be killed. That's verse 5, chapter 11. But look at those on verse chapter 13, verse 15. Those who oppose the worship of the beast will be threatened with death. Same basic concept, isn't it? God's word has power to withhold rain. The second beast is able to withhold economic trade. God's word can turn water into blood and perform other miracles. And the second beast does great wonders and miracles to deceive the world. Near the close of the 1260-year prophecy, God's word is killed. You remember that in the French Revolution, atheistic French Revolution, God's word was not allowed to be available to people for three and a half years. So it was dead, but you know where it happened to the first beast? He receives a deadly wound. But you remember the history after the French Revolution, after the Bible had been dead for three and a half years, it's what? It comes back to life. And what happens when the deadly wound is healed? Well, <laughs> what happened? The deadly wound winds up being healed. I answered my own question, didn't I? Okay. What you have on one side, you have on the other side. Isn't that fascinating? Well, and this is, and this is the thing. The question is why? This isn't something, wow, isn't that neat, right? The question is, why did God write it that way? That's the question. And that's why, you know, I want you to keep look at this. I know this is a lot in just an hour or so. But to me, when I looked at this structure, I said, there's a purpose behind this structure. There's a reason why the words and phrases in 8 through 11 are the same words and phrases in 13 through 16. Somehow God's tying these particular chapters on either side of the center together. It's not that it's the same words and phrases in 8 through 11 and then 20 through 22. It's the same words and phrases on the exact opposite side. Why does God write it that way? Is he just a stylish writer? Or is there a purpose? Yeah, there's a purpose. He's saying, okay, these particular chapters are tied together and I want you to study. You ever find that out that God wrote the word in a way that he purposely made it so we had to dig? It does take effort, doesn't it? Okay. So if we go back to 13, so we, we answered kind of the question, what, what, what do we learn from chapter 11, how God has warred against evil through the century? He uses the word. He uses truth. What else are you going to use? Right? So in chapter 13, when it's talking about <clears throat> how will God fight against evil in the end of time, what do we learn about 13 in the answer to that question? How will God fight against evil in the end of time? Chapter 13. Well, basically in 13, he's at least identifying the two powers we're fighting against. First beast, second beast. Now, we can keep our eye on our Iran. We could be very interested in the economy. We could be interested in North Korea, right? But boy, if you ever got to keep your focus on any evil forces in the world, what you're really particularly interested in is what is the papacy up to and what are apostate Protestants up to. I mean, when you look at Revelation 13, oh, that's, those are the two superpowers on the evil side. When you look at the book Great Controversy, these are the two powers. It's what they're up to and what they're going to wind up doing together. And we do need to take some time, I think. We know what's going to happen. And we, we keep hearing things. But I, I do want us to be careful not to be looking after all these other evils out there, you know. But what I really find interesting about the book of Revelation is before it shows anything on earth, 
it always gives us a picture of heaven first. Isn't that beautiful? So when you wake up in the morning, he's basically saying, think of heaven first. I mean, your day is going to be filled with earthly things. Okay? But start your day looking up. See the face of God before you see the face of man. Because you need heavenly scenes to deal with what's happening down here. To remind you, this is not our home. We're just strangers, pilgrims on the earth. We're just setting up an embassy here right now. Right? You're going to have your embassy in Colorado. and For God. Right? An embassy here. And from here, we reach people. And because... Uh, we're citizens of heaven. Okay? So let's go on to the next chapters, 10 through 14. These are chapters on either side of chapter 12. In these chapters, we find Christ associated with a cloud. In chapter 10, he's clothed with a cloud. In chapter 14, he's sitting on a cloud. Okay? And then, also in these two chapters, we have reference to the 2300-day prophecy. We know that in chapter 14 for sure because it talks about the everlasting gospel, and that judgment is come. We know that's in reference to the 2300-day prophecy, right? But you realize in Revelation, let's look at that, Revelation 10. Revelation 10, verses 5 through 7. And it says, And the angel which I saw stand on the sea and upon the earth lift up his hand to heaven, and swore by him that, that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein. That sounds like Revelation 14, doesn't it? Three angels message, um, and the earth and the things that are therein, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no what's that in reference to? No more time prophecy, because the last time prophecy, which is the twenty three hundred day prophecy, was just fulfilled. We're not tested on time anymore. Okay? Ever since eighteen forty four, we could have gone home. It's not based on time, it's based on our condition spiritually. You know, there's, he could have come soon after 1844. Do you realize he could have come soon after 1856? Do you ever hear about that story? Very interesting story. In 1856, there was a beginning of something called the, the um, revival of a million converts. In 1856, James White had put on the back of a review, are we more like Laodicea or uh, Philadelphia? And the reason he was answered, asked this was because there was the little print shop and there was thousands of copies of literature ready to be distri distri distributed, but it was still sitting on the shelf. Now, mind you, 1856 is only 12 years after the disappointment. Still pretty warm in their heart, right? But even after 12 years, literature was just being stacked up in the print shop. And there was about 2,000 professed Adventists at this point. Well, when he wrote that in the back of the review, he started getting a, a response. He got a 400 people responding, a 20% response. Wouldn't that be wonderful? 20% response of people rededicating their life. So while there was this revival going on amongst this Advent movement, there was revival going on outside of Adventism called the Revival of a Million Converts. And there were so many people coming to Christ, sometimes they printed on the front page of newspapers. So what was God wanting to do? He wanted to see a revival happening amongst his own people, a revival on the outside, and that the two would meet. Isn't that right? <laughs> okay. And uh, But there was rumors of a civil war, and then there was the economy, and there was all these other kinds of problems that people start taking their focus off the revival and start putting their focus on all the problems in the world. Christ would have soon come after 1856-58. They took their focus off the ball. And he's going to try to do the same thing. There's a lot of things you could focus on right now. But there's one thing you need to focus on. It's the revival going on in our own hearts. We've got to keep our focus. The devil's got to try to distract you over the economy, the war in Afghanistan, uh, what's going on in Greece, what's going on in Spain, you see, what's happening with the euro, you see, what's happening with unemployment. Now, I'm not saying these things aren't concerns, but if you get so consumed that you don't experience a revival in your own heart each day, 
receiving that fresh supply of grace each day, we're not ready. We've got to be that people who have such a focus. Revival, revival, revival. In fact, I, I don't even know of a piece of literature within Adventism that's revival oriented. Wouldn't it be nice to have something, even if it's just an e-letter, that keeps focusing on and reminding people, revival, revival, revival. Even if it was sent out as an iTunes, it was just even a one-minute, five-minute message that you could have downloaded to your cell phone immediately. Right? Don't take your focus off the revival. Let me share this precious quote with you. Encouraging one another. Wouldn't that be wonderful? All around the world, all of a sudden, God's people are focused. Oh, I've got to keep my focus. That's right. We need that. We really do need that. <clears throat> There's more similarities on both chapters. They're told to go preach the message to the whole world. Um, and then we have, and this one takes a little bit more. Um, we have the 144,000 on chapter 14. But where would you have them in chapter 10? Well, this is where we get into chapter 11. Let me look at that real quick. Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. So in chapter 10, you had a people who ate the little book of Daniel. It was sweet, and then it became bitter, right? <coughs> because Jesus didn't come. And then he, he tells them to get up and prophesy again, verse 11 of chapter 10. And he said unto them, or unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And in verse, chapter 11, verse 1, And there was given me a rod, a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar and them that worship therein. Well, so what's the connection between the 144,000 and, and God's people measuring the sanctuary, the temple? And I found it kind of interesting, and, and, I'm, and it's, I'm just throwing this out for you, is that part of how God fights against evil in the end of time is chapter 13, he tells us who the evil forces are the main ones. But chapter 14, he says, look, you need to fight the evil in the end of time with a special message, the three angels' message, right? And if we don't preach that message, who else is going to preach it? Somehow there has to be a message that judgment has come. Why is that important in our world in the end of time? Because most people don't believe in it. Most people actually think our world's getting better. Isn't that interesting? The, the timing <coughs> that judgment has come is basically was a message that the world is getting worse. We start preaching that in the 1800s when everybody thought everything was getting better. We had industrialization <coughs> um, with, with the Civil War, hopefully the end of slavery. Everything's getting better. But they sing the song. My eyes have seen the glory of, you see, in the middle of the 1800s, they believed that they were ushering in the long-awaited millennium. You know, before industrialization, people farmed the same way for thousands of years. Used either ox or cattle. Went to town the same way. With industrialization, things started changing. Everybody thought, the world's getting better. And then we start preaching the message, oh, God's got to come here and burn it up with fire. What? Everything's getting better. Why is he going to do that? And so we live in this world in which we're preaching this message that judgment has come when everybody says, wow, did you get the last iPad? Isn't that great? And we're saying it's getting worse, and they're saying it's getting better. There's more freedom today. Look at Arab Spring. But you know what we have to point to? Yes. Well, you know, it's a very good thing that you're raising here about people not believing in the soon imminent return, personal return of Christ. Because that's why people, by and large, rejected Adventism in the middle of the 1800s. They really didn't believe in the soon imminent personal return of Christ because they believed they were just ready to usher in this thousand years of peace. And, and we really are one of the few people who still believe in the personal imminent return of Jesus. Um, but we've got to preach this message and, um, and, and preach it around the world at a time when most people aren't looking for a judgment. They're looking for a stupendous crisis. They know things are happening. They're not sure. But people aren't really looking for a judgment. 
Okay. Well, the connection here, I believe, between 144,000 and those who measure the temple is in, in 1844, our people went from the holy place into the most holy. Now, 144,000 is 12 times 12 times 1,000, right? 12, they're part of God's kingdom, times 12, they're a special part of God's kingdom, would you agree? Times 1,000. Well, what's 1,000? If 144 is 12 times 12, 1,000 is 10 by 10 by 10. Do you know there's only one thing in the Bible that's 10 by 10 by 10? It's the most holy place. I just found it really interesting that the connection between the 144,000 and the people measuring the temple and the place they went into was the most holy place happened to help explain what this number is. Now, I, I still believe it's a, a certain number, you know, but it doesn't mean that God couldn't have meaning behind it to help explain who they are. Yeah. Uh, so how does God fight against evil through the centuries? Well, chapter 11, he uses his word. In chapter 10, he uses people. He raises up reformers. Isn't that what our pioneers were? Isn't it interesting that the only way to really fight against evil, and this is the way it's always been through the centuries, is raising up reformers. People are willing to take a stand. Because how, how else does it happen? Right? And how God's going to fight against evil in the end of time? He can't just have a three angels message. What else does he need? 144,000. The world cannot just hear a message. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's going to have to be lived, completely lived out perfectly by a group of people. It's the only way we can reach them. I, I find this interesting. Sister White made this statement that about how um, as the world is somehow getting darker, we have to have a, a baptism of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the, the world is getting more wicked at a certain pace. And do you realize, just to keep up with the increased wickedness of the world, we have to be growing spiritually at least at that same pace. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> that somehow, as the world's getting more wicked, God's people have to be becoming more righteous, more spiritual. At, at least the same pace, or we're losing ground. <clears throat> Chapters 8 and 9, 7 trumpets, 7 last plagues. How long do I have here? Am I okay still? Okay. Is it three th up to 3.30, was it? Okay. Well, let's go through this quickly here. <coughs> Excuse me. 7 trumpets, 7 last plagues, both on the exact opposite side of chapter 12. But notice that they have the same key word in the exact same order. First trumpet cast upon the earth. First plague poured on the earth. First trumpet, one-third of the sea became blood. Second a plague, sea became blood. Third trumpet, one-third of the rivers and fountains of water, blood. Third plague, rivers and fountains become blood. Amen. Fourth trumpet, sun smitten. Fourth plague, sun scourges the earth. Isn't that interesting? Just coincidence. No, no, no. <laughs> Big bang? No, no. It's a darkness, number five uh, for both. Darkness for fifth trumpet, fifth plague. And then it's sixth plague or sixth trumpet, uh, great river Euphrates dries up. Sixth trumpet or plague, great river Euphrates dries up. Uh, seventh trumpet, lightnings, voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake and great hail. Seventh plague, voices, and thunders, and lightning, and a great earthquake and great hail. Isn't that something? And the question is, why? See, this is the thing. They can, nobody can deny the structure. The structure is there. The question is, why is it there? Okay. So, someone might say, oh, there's 14 plagues in the end of time. No. No, it doesn't mean there's 14 plagues. But it does mean that the trumpets and the plagues are related somehow. Now, the trumpets are on the historical side. And the plagues are on the end time side. 
Same keyword in the exact same order, and the question is why? God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, if I had a hard time understanding one of them, let's say the trumpets were the hardest thing for me to understand. Where's one place I could go? Go to the exact opposite side in the book of Revelation. Go to the end time side. Look at those seven last plagues. Now, if I know what the plagues are about, then I would know what the trumpets are about, but only from a historical view. So I start looking at these plagues and I start saying, okay, why, why are the seven last plagues falling? Why are they falling on the wicked? What are they doing? What have they rejected? They've rejected truth. What else have they rejected? Christ. But they're persecuting the people who have the truth. What more could God do for them? It isn't that they just rejected light. They want to eradicate those who have the light. Isn't that right? Well, then now I say, okay. Well, then that must be what the trumpets are about. But throughout history. How God wound up blowing trumpets at a time when truth was being rejected. And when God's people are just about being annihilated by those who rejected the truth. And that's how we've always understood those trumpets. Is that they, they're understood historically at a time when the papacy was trying to wipe out God's people in one decisive blow. And so he brought in the, the Muslims here and different things. At a time, God would blow a trumpet. Will God blow trumpets for us too? Yeah, same yesterday, today, and forever. So those seven trumpets are like God's guarantee to us in the end of time that he'll blow trumpets for us too. That he'll intervene in history. When it looks like we are about ready to be wiped out. He intervenes. Isn't that something? So when we think about how God's warred against evil in the past, chapters 8 through 9, 10, and 11, we have these chapters. Chapter 11, he uses his word. He's always used his word to fight against error in the past. Chapter 10, he uses reformers. He uses people. In chapters 8 and 9, he personally intervenes. He has to. He's still in control, right? And so when we look at what God does in the end of time, how will he fight against the evil of our own time? Well, first of all, he identifies who they are, chapter 13. In chapter 14, he tells us how he wants to reach them with a message and with a people. But once they get to the point of trying to wipe out those people, he intervenes. Does that make sense? <clears throat> chapters 4 through 7, cha chapter 17 through 19 have similar words and phrases. Um, and now we're into that different ripple effect about how God judges evil. How has he and how will he? And we looked through 17 through 19. We looked at how those chapters really talk about judgment. Let's just look at some of the similarities between these sections. Uh, in both of these sections, we have the four living creatures and the 24 elders. We have Jesus described as he who was, is, and is to come. But the beast is described as he who was and is not and yet is. There's a book with seven seals. On the other side, the book of life. Both are actually visible visible uh, prophecy, visual uh, chapters uh, in the first section. It talks about come and see. And in chapter 17, come hither and I will show unto thee. Uh, the seal of God and the saints of the foreheads. The name of Babylon is on the forehead of the harlot church. Very similar words and phrases, isn't it? God's people are slain for the word of God, and the harlot on the other side, opposite side, is drunk with the blood of the saints. The saints cry out, How long dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And then on the opposite side, God is actually avenging the blood of the saints. We have a great multitude redeemed that's seen in heaven, and a great multitude of redeemed seen in heaven. <coughs> Point 10. <coughs> the white robes of the saints were washed in the blood of the Christ. And on the opposite side, the saints are dressed in fine linen, which represents the righteousness of Christ. Whatever you have on one side, you have on the other side. Okay? Now, the question is how do we know how God judged evil in the past? And if we turn to Revelation 6, just quickly, and you'll want to study this further on your own, because we want to kind of get into the next section, too. 
is, is I, I do understand historically that in chapter six you have the white horse and the red horse and the black horse and the pale horse and then you got a fifth seal and a, and a sixth seal. And even though I do believe those represent different epics in church history that we're going through early church and then the next phase all the way up through till the second coming of Christ. These horses, though, still represent spiritual conditions. Now, notice the safe condition, which is this first one. I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given his hand, or given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, what do you see in that? In the Bible, what does white represent? Purity. Okay, and so he's riding a white horse. He's riding upon purity of doctrine, isn't he? Now, who's the rider? Okay, so Jesus has to be the one leading. Okay, now when you look at the other horses, Jesus isn't the one riding the horse. Isn't that something? So as soon as Jesus isn't the one leading, you start getting into these different colors. And they just get worse, one right after the other, right? Okay. And that's what happens when we don't allow Jesus, when we don't recognize his authority in our life, which is a central issue. Isn't that it? It gets right back to who has the authority in your life. Once Jesus isn't the rider, you're not riding on that horse of purity anymore. And so you get on the red horse, and then that's when we just begin to start compromising, isn't it? As soon as we don't spend that time with Jesus... Isn't that when we start compromising? But that's not the worst condition. Then it gets into the next horse, and then finally the pale horse, right? Which is death. Death is the rider. That's terrible, isn't it? And that's what happened in church history. The church that deviated from the truth got worse and worse, didn't she? And that will happen in our lives, too. Once we start deviating, you probably witnessed that in people's lives who left the truth. And they went way off. Okay? Okay, so so these talk, these talk about saved conditions. Um, let's get into our next section here. Any questions about uh, how God judges? So in chapters 4 through 7, he's basically given us descriptions of saved conditions, lost conditions. Okay? And it's interesting that 17 through 19, the focus is on the judgment of the harlot church. And right now there's some emphasis. In fact, I just read somebody's um, um, thought that the king of the north of Daniel 11 is, is the Ottoman Empire, which is what Uriah Smith taught. But I think it's very important. When you look at great controversy, it is so saturated with the papacy, the historical section, the end time section of it. Revelation 13 on is really about the papacy. You know, the papacy really has caused more harm in our world than any other institution. It's not Islam. Yeah. It's not Islam, it's the papacy. It is the papacy. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's look at this real quickly. Revelation 1 through 3, 19 through 22. In the chart, I had 20 through 22, but there are some words and phrases of 19. And this is a section about how will God deliver us from evil. I want us to see how many words and phrases are repeated in both sections. And then be, focus on where the focus is, what it predominantly is on. I, John, right, right, testimony of Jesus, king of kings, faithful and true. Who are we talking about? Jesus. His eyes is a flame of fire. Out of his mouth went a two-edged sword. Rules with a rod of iron. Alpha, omega, beginning and ending. First and last. Morning star, behold, I come quickly. For the time is at hand. New Jerusalem. Um, things that he'll show unto his servants. Blessed is he who readeth. <coughs> tree of life, tree of life. Oop, got to fix that up. He that overcometh, even so, amen. Um, the focus of chapters 1 through 3 is these seven churches, different spiritual conditions, and God has a remedy for each one. And let me just tell you how valuable it is. I actually thought of writing a book, and maybe somebody here wants to do that. Take the seven churches, seven different spiritual conditions, and God's solution. In other words, God's trying to teach us how to help one another shine brighter for Christ. You see, each church is, is described as a candlestick. Candlesticks are to shine. 
So God takes look, each each spiritual condition. He says, you know something? It doesn't matter where you are, what you've done. You can shine brighter, right? And here's a solution for you. And I looked at Ephesus. Ephesus was a church that was conservative. They preached the truth. They didn't like people who didn't preach the truth. And, and yet he said, you, you're, you have a diminished love. You lost your first love. And I remember where I was working this one place, and um, there was a nurse there, and she was very conservative and very hard worker. But, boy, she was just rough with people, you know. And, I, you know, she's kind of like Ephesus. I'm going to try this. <laughs> and I, I looked at what God said to Ephesus. And what he said to Ephesus is he starts, starts off saying something he likes about Ephesus. That's right. That's right. That's right. So I said something to her about what I liked about her. And then God said to Ephesus, now this is something I'm concerned about. So I said, I'm kind of concerned about this. And then, and then he says to Ephesus, you know, if, then he goes back and says something nice about him. So then I went and said something nice to her, right? And then, and then God with Ephesus says, now if you overcome what I'm concerned about, these are the blessings. And I told her, you know what's going to happen to your ministry if you could start learning to work better with people? Your ministry is going to grow. You see? And it did seem like she was shining brighter, which is all according to the Holy Spirit, right? But it's like n- none of us were born knowing how to help one another shine brighter. And so when I looked at like Thyatira, which is about the papacy, how Christ is described is very significant to each one of these. And we have this in our commentary. It's like, it's like, how do you help a church that says it is Christ? You know, and, and it starts with Thyatira. It says, I am the son of God. You know, it's, it's a matter. You, the only hope for the papacy is the point that as Christ is the only mediator between God and man. He is the only one. It's, it's, it's the only thing that could save her from her error. As long as they don't see that, you know, and she'll, she'll not repent. We know that prophetically. Let me close. Do we have enough time just to close here? I want us to see uh, on Daniel that it has the exact same, and this is the only slide here. This is the last slide. Now, you might say, well, Jeff, there's, there's 12 chapters, and you've got the Senate 4 and 5. You're... You don't seem to be doing very good with fractions or numbers anymore, right? But I want you to notice something. Chapter 1 is written in Hebrew, and chapters 8 through 12 are written in Hebrew. Chapters 2 through two through 7 are written in Aramaic. And that's what tipped me off to this. I thought, ah, there it is. There it is. And now it made sense. Because the Babylonians come, chapter 1, they ransack the sanctuary and they defile it. Chapter 8 on is about the cleansing of the sanctuary. Isn't that interesting? Whoops. So when you have this structure, now it all fits perfectly together. Chapters 2 through 7, four different metals, four different beasts. Same empires, right? Worship of the golden image, worship of man. Two Babylonian kings. Now, you remember in the original prophet's code of Revelation, the first question, what's the origin of evil? Do these two chapters answer the origin of evil? Nebuchadnezzar wound up walking on all fours because of, isn't this great Babylon that, right? Because of pride. And when you read Patriarchs and Prophets chapter 1, it will use words like pride, discontent, jealousy, Different words that point to, that gives us a little understanding how even Ezekiel and Isaiah talk about how somehow because of his own beauty, he looked at himself as if somehow he could attribute who he was to himself. He didn't give God the credit for all the powers that he had. Somehow he looked at his own beauty and that corrupted him. But I want you to know that this also teaches us about the central issue in the great controversy. Let's turn to the very center of 4 and 5 of Daniel. Now, you remember, <coughs> excuse me, 4 and 5 of Daniel, that that taught us that the great controversy was over the authority of Jesus. And the last verse of chapter 4, and, and, and Daniel was trying to win Nebuchadnezzar. For 40 years, he witnessed to Nebuchadnezzar. 40 years. 
And at the end of 40 years, what does Nebuchadnezzar finally do? Verse 4, or verse last verse of chapter 4, verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he's able to abase. What did Nebuchadnezzar finally do after 40 years? He recognized the authority of the true God in his life. Isn't that interesting? Up until that, he always recognized the authority of his own gods. And finally, at the very center of Daniel, in the chiastic structure of Daniel, <laughs> in the prophet's code of Daniel, you have, it's all about authority. Isn't that interesting? How that's a central part of the book of Revelation and also the book of Daniel. As we scroll out, you remember the second question that Revelation answered? Origin of evil and then how God wars against the evil forces. Isn't it interesting that in the story of the three Hebrews who refused to bow down to the golden image, isn't that really a story about how God wars against evil who war against his people? Isn't that interesting? And isn't it interesting that on the exact opposite side you got Daniel and how God intervenes to war against the evil forces that are warring against Daniel, his servant? Isn't that interesting? I mean, it's the exact same structure as Revelation. Answering the exact same four questions. Four and five, what's the origin of evil, which has to do with pride and over authority. Chapters three through six, that next ripple effect. You know, how does God war against evil? And if we would spend some time, we don't have time now, but you think of those two chapters, chapters three and six, and you start thinking, how does God war against evil when evil's trying to bring harm upon his people? Isn't that interesting? We learn things, well, God's with his people, right? You know, he strengthens them during this time and so forth. The next ripple effect, you remember the next question is about how does God judge evil? The rise and fall of empires, right? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. What is that an expression of? That each empire failed. And so God permitted them to fall and brought the next one in. That's judgment. Daniel chapter 2 is about judgment, isn't it? The stone cut without hands, that's judgment, isn't it? And Daniel 7, that's all about judgment, right? Where the ancient of days, right? The judgment is set. In fact, Daniel 7 is the chapter about judgment. Daniel's name means God is judge. And then in that last ripple effect, how does God deliver his people from evil? And if we would spend time in Daniel 1 and then 8 through 12, we start thinking about how does God deliver his people from evil? In chapter 1, just real quickly, what are some of the things we learn in chapter 1 about how God helps us overcome evil? What's that? With the word, okay. What else? Yeah, in Daniel 1. Diet, okay. What else? No compromising. You made up his mind, right? These are all very valuable lessons about how God helped his people overcome evil even back then. And so there's so much in Daniel chapter 1, fellowship, being with like believers. Um, Daniel, we understand, was like age 15 when he um, was taken captive. And Belshazzar was 15 when he became king. You might say Daniel's about a story about two 15-year-olds. You know, and so, um, but anyway, and the cleansing of the sanctuary, of course, is all about overcoming sin, isn't it? The whole purpose of the cleansing of the sanctuary is that corresponding work. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it was obedience even in the going. And, and so, and, and battles were won ahead of time. Here's a young man who had been prepared for the invasion of Babylon. And I can tell you right now, the Babylonians are coming. And we've got to get ready. And Daniel's parents prepared Daniel for the Babylonians coming. I mean, it was prophesied. And part of Daniel being strong was his preparation, how he lived his whole life, and then taken captive. You know, there was thousands, like you say, of these young men that were taken, tied <coughs> neck to neck, right? Yeah, they were tied neck to neck. And they journeyed, they figured it was about a six-month journey from Jerusalem to Babylon. And, and then you go, you know where you're going to a city called Babylon. There was a lot of atrocities committed. And yet, through those whole travels, we never hear Daniel complain. So part of overcoming evil is trust and faith in, in whom you believe. 
It's all part of it, isn't it? <coughs> so many rich lessons. But these are just this is just the structure. We haven't even talked about any of the symbols. But at least at this point, you know what each chapter is about. It's answering these four basic questions. Let me just say this in closing. It's answering the questions of the origin of evil, how God fights evil, how he judges evil, and how he delivers us from evil. And now that's all that's left is go back and understand the symbols. You've got a historical section, end time section. It's that simple. More there. So, any other questions or comments? Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And let's uh, kneel for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're very thankful for our opportunity to study together. Thank you for wisdom, Father, that you shed to on each one of us from above. Father, we want to not just be readers of your words, but doers of your word. And help us, Father, to also take one verse at a time and to own that verse, to make it a part of our life as we read these wonderful words of life. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.